uh, I must say that <clears throat> I'm, I'm inclined to agree with our brother Peter Ramsey. He was with you last week, and my daughter was telling me that he gave a little spiel about how you've had so many amazing preachers, and now you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. But uh, so anyway, we, it's very, very pleasant to be with you. Very happy with that. But I agree with Peter. And uh, I think I'm suffering from something that we're all suffering with. And that I think I, I've called the condition turkey brain. Uh, so much turkey, <laughs> it feels like my thoughts are all jumbled and mumbled. And so I, I'm hoping that you have turkey brain the same as me so that you won't know exactly how jumbled the thoughts are. There. But take heart, next week, Brody, you'll have things straightened out, and you'll be in good hands with the Lord's help next week. But anyway, with that little disclaimer and preamble, I just want to share something that I hope would be just encouraging. I was thinking about something else that was a bit heavier and a bit more challenging to the mind, but I've just settled on some thoughts that, that I've just been enjoying. And so maybe if I enjoy them, you'll enjoy them. Maybe what's good for for you, for, for me rather, hopefully that'll be good for you. So uh, not, not anything too challenging. Hopefully it'll be encouraged. We're, go, we're encouraging. We're going to read from the gospel of Matthew chapter 14. Matthew's gospel chapter 14. And uh, verse 22, Matthew 14, verse 22. <clears throat> and it says, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go to the other side while he sent the multitude away. Now, I always think that's interesting because sometimes when the storms in life come, we assume that we're not in the right way. We're in the wrong way. When things get challenging and difficult, sometimes we think, well, something must be wrong. I must have done something wrong. But we know from this verse here that that. The Lord was in control and he had constrained them. They were in his will. And so that's interesting. That's a good life lesson to learn. And I see it says my internet connection is unstable. I just make sure I'm connected. Well, uh, well, it's hopefully it's all right. So we'll hope we'll uh, get along okay here. Because a lot, one other time I was with you, I dropped you or you dropped me or something, but hopefully it'll go well. So they were, he constrained them to get into the ship and to go, and that was so they could go to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he sent, had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain to pray, and when the even was come, he was there alone. But this is what I was really thinking about. This verse, it got me thinking. You know how when you're reading through the Bible and there's, there's one little verse that stands out. Make note of that. You who are younger, make note of the things that jump off the page at you, because likely the, it's the Spirit of God speaking to you. So here it says, but, so you'll notice the difference. He was up in the mountain praying, but the ship, the ship, what about the ship? The ship was now in the midst of the sea. Tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. So the ship is in the midst of the sea. I started to think of some of the times that's used in the New Testament. It's actually used a lot of, a lot of times, that expression, in the midst. But tonight we're just going to deal with this simple little one, that the ship was in the midst of the sea. Tossed with waves. For the wind was contrary. And the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. And straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. If you were to read John's account, it's just the simple idea. You look at the Newberry notes in John, it'll say, I am. One of the great I am statements and identifications and so that's what he is saying. Be of good cheer. I am. And then, of course, I guess it would be logical then, be not afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come into the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. 
he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, where didst thou doubt? Why did you waver or hesitate? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And then uh, they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now, you just stop there and think of that for a minute. Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Do you know what will keep us in good times? What will keep us when, God forbid, if you or I experience cancer or hospitalization or many of the other challenges that we can be challenged with? It's truth. A nice pep talk is wonderful, and this is sort of what this is. This is really nothing much more than a pep talk, if you will, tonight. Just with God's help, just a little encouraging words. But the truth of the scripture, of doctrine, that's what will really keep us in the difficult times. Because when it comes to the time when I need the pep talk, I won't be there. Hopefully the words will stick with us. But the truth of the knowledge of who Christ is and his presence with us, that's the crucial thing. Peter speaks about in the knowledge, in the grace, yes, but it's in the knowledge of Christ and in who he is. So that's what we really need. We, we need to get to know Christ, who he is, what the Bible says about him. We need to learn the truths of Christ inside out, backwards and forwards. Learn them and put them into our minds and imbibe the truth of it and let it, let it set in our hearts so that when we are in the difficulty, it is the presence of Christ. It is the knowledge of Christ. It is the doctrine surrounding Christ and of his word that will help us and keep us. And that's really, I think this little trip and this challenging night was pretty well worthwhile because it ended like this, of a truth, they're worshiping. But they're not just worshiping the way people know worship today, just kind of a fluttery feeling and they're singing a song and no, no, they're worshiping on the basis of truth. Truth, thou art the Christ. And he, he's the one who is the son of God. What's a little storm when Christ, the son of God, was with them? You see? So wouldn't it be wonderful if that if we could, in the storms that we might be passing through, if we can grasp and learn something through the storms, something that can help us really grow in, in the knowledge of Christ, and that we might be able to just worship, but be settled on truth, and therefore to have a sense of peace. And so I just want to think about this little story for a few things, a few minutes. I want to think, first of all, about the truth, the action rather that preceded the story, because there was lots of action. What a day that would have been if we could have followed him through that day. I mean, it started a bit rough, if you will, the, what led up to this story, because they got, they got devastating news that John the Baptist, he had been decapitated. He died as a martyr. And the Lord Jesus leads them away for a time alone. And then comes that, that period of when the, the multitudes are there, and he begins to speak to them, and they're hungry. And, and he teaches them something about how Christ can feed people in the wilderness. You know, he can feed us in the wilderness, too. He can feed us even when it comes to Zoom. Maybe we can't meet physically the way we would wish, but Christ can feed us in the wilderness. And lest we mix, mix, mix things up and become confused, that's where we are. We're not in heaven now. We are on the promised land. We are conquering land now. We are gaining scriptural truth. We're planting our feet on what the scripture gives us as far as truth is. So we are in the promised land, but there's still enemies. And there's a sense in which it's still the wilderness also. We're not in heaven yet. So let's take heart tonight and remember that we are in the wilderness and yet we are in the promised land as well. We're conquering and we're, we're in the battle. You know, I was thinking about that. I was actually 
thinking a little bit of the armor when it comes to Ephesians. And I thought maybe I would speak about that. And I was just challenged to think about Ephesians as it begins in the first chapter. This is a digression, by the way. But it begins in the first chapter with seated in Christ in the heavenlies, accepted in the beloved. And you think, what a book this is going to be. But you would hardly expect that a book like that is going to end on the battlefield, would you? But that's where it ends. We end on the battlefield. And he's fitting us because while we're worshiping and we're seated in Christ positionally, in the practical everyday sense, we are living in the battlefield. And the word of God fits us for that. And here was Christ and he is feeding these people in the wilderness because Christ can do that. And Philip, he throws up his hands. And Andrew, they don't know how can we feed these people in the wilderness. Ah, Christ has the answer for that, doesn't he? And so here they are, and they're, they have that wonderful experience where there was 5,000 men and then the women and children, and they were fed in that place on that day. That must have been a great action. And they're scurrying to and fro, and they're, they're feeding people, and they're carrying bread and fishes. And then when it's all done, it's just like when conference is over, and we're just kind of picking up the pieces, and they end up with 12 nice little hand baskets, don't they? 12 lunch baskets, and they're carrying them down towards the water, and the disciple is putting them into the ship. That was a good day, wasn't it? Maybe some of us are looking back today, and we're thinking about the action we once knew. The action before COVID times, the action before March for myself and some of us and David Hunt and Michael Leger, we were up north. We were active. We were moving. We were sharing the gospel. And yet for all these months, there's a sense in which we can only look back in the action and we can wonder, will we ever see that again? And as maybe to a little extent, we're, we're, we're in the storm. But here they are, and they're looking back at the actions that preceded it. Well, let us not forget the actions that preceded it. But I was thinking about this in this way today. Do you suppose that the Lord is teaching them that it's not all about the actions of the past or the present or the future? There are some things that we can only learn in the storms, in the difficulties. And the Lord is constraining them. He says, you're going to the other side. Maybe they held back and we said, we want to stay with you. But he said, no. And he's moving them. He's compelling them to go into the ship because there's something that they were going to learn that night that they could not learn any other way. And I think that that's one thing. Anybody that's been on the road a little bit, we, we would never pick the challenging times. We would never pick the storms of life. But we would look back afterwards and we would think that's where we learned the most. Great to be active. But for these people, there was actions that preceded it, but they couldn't learn what they needed to learn in the action. They could learn some things there, but what they were about to learn, they had to go through the storm to learn it. So let's just pause and think about, rather than just becoming depressed, and we sometimes, you know, we can become depressed, discouraged with this thing as it stretches on and on and on. Could it be? That the Lord has constrained us to go this way because there's something we are to learn, something we are learning about Christ, and we're learning it in the storm. So the action that preceded it. But I want to think about the situation that developed because that was kind of what got me thinking about it. Now there is a ship in the midst of the sea. Now that doesn't sound good to me. That sounds to me like the waves were rising up on every side. And I remember fishermen telling me just in our little Northumberland Strait that sometimes when you're out there and the boat goes down into the trough, you can't see over the next wave. So you're, you're kind of in the low time. And then you come up over and it's a high point and then you're plunging into the water again. I think that's what they were going through. They were in the midst of the sea. And that's what the verse that we highlighted, that tells us about it. It tells us just about the danger, the danger of them going under. That was what was bothering them. That was the situation that developed. It was a danger to them. Maybe you're feeling the danger tonight. You're feeling like the ship in the midst of the sea. Well, these disciples could relate. They were in a, they were in a ship in the midst of the sea. But not only that, they were tossed by the waves. So not just when one wave would go, then there would be another way following it. You know, we're, we're the, the country at this time is what they're experiencing, what they call the world really is experiencing the second wave, only the second wave when it comes to COVID times. 
But these disciples, they were experiencing many waves. Consecutive waves were coming, one after the other, and it seemed to be relentless. So not only was there a danger of going under, but there was a relentless assault. Well, maybe it's only the second wave, but it could well be that there is a relentless assault on, on our small ship. So that wave after wave of discouragement and, and trying times, and maybe it's every day as it comes, it just brings with it another wave of worry and hard times. That's where the disciples were. That was the situation that developed. Relentless assault from the waves. But then there was the wind. The wind was contrary. So that in this night, it seemed as if progress was halted. There was little or no progress. How can we do what the Savior has told us to do when there's, we're, we're, we're just able to make little or no progress? Is that what some of us are wondering? During this time, we're thinking, well, things are pretty much halted for God, are they? It may seem like we're making little or no progress, but we can look around us and we can count the things that have taken place. We can count our blessings during COVID time. And I think that there is still progress for God. But the thing is this that we need to search ourselves for. Am I making progress for God? Because this was a group of 12. But there's one man that looked back on this night. And I think that he would write about it later, and he would remember that night, Peter would, because there was a night, and there was a storm that he made leaps and bounds of progress. These people come out the other side knowing that, of a truth, this was the Son of God. That was what their lips said. If they were uncertain before, they grew in their knowledge of Christ. So there may have appeared to have been little or no progress, but there was progress. Maybe they couldn't see it at all, but so the wind was against them. It was contrary. Wherever they turned, whatever they did, the wind was contrary. Maybe that's what we're experiencing. Seems that wherever we turn, we just start to meet again, and we're pushed back again. Just seem to make progress, and then, then there's pushback, and there's new restrictions, and there's new worries. Well, whatever the case when it comes to COVID times and all the rest of it, Let's see if we can make some personal progress and learn something of Christ in the storm. So there was progress. The wind was contrary, and they thought there was little or no progress. You know what John tells us in verse 16 of his account, 17 of his account in chapter 6? He says that it was now dark. In fact, the dark had already come. It was dark. And it seemed that as if things could get no worse, it seemed that maybe the Lord put them in the boat when it wasn't yet dark. But at this point in the storm, with this situation, situation that developed, now it's now dark. And they can't begin to navigate any. They're losing their bearings. They don't know where to turn. They don't know how to reach the other side. And so it was now dark. So we've learned something about their progress. They were in danger of going under. The ship was in the midst of the sea. They were being tossed by the waves. There was a relentless assault of wave after wave. The wind was contrary to them. It seemed as if there was little or no progress. And finally, it was now dark. And they didn't see. They couldn't see. They didn't know where to turn or what to do. And they were confused in the dark. That was the situation that developed. Other things could be said about that. But I just want to leave that one and move on to the next thought. My next thought was this. I want to think of the propulsion that they relied on. The, the propulsion that they relied on. What was moving them? What was propelling them? Well, these little ships, apparently, if I understand correctly, they had two main sources of propulsion. They had a little, a little mast and a little sail. They've unearthed boats now. In times of drought, there was one little ship that's called the Jesus Boat, and uh, they've, uh, they've unearthed that, and it's a little ship about 27 feet long or so and about seven and a half feet wide, and it likely had a little mast with a little sail, and it has four, a place for four oarsmen, four places staggered positions for rowing. It was too narrow, perhaps, for to have them side by side, and so there's staggered positions, and I think it's four rowers. And so we learned that they were wind-powered, first of all. This little ship was wind-powered. Well, 
what's our system of propulsion? You know that sometimes we're wind powered, aren't we? That's what we do when we're going down a hill. We just kind of coast. Did you ever coast as a Christian? No, it wasn't it easy to coast a year ago? You could just coast from conference to conference. Every little breeze that a, that a speaker worked up was just a nice little breeze, and it would push you on to the next conference. It would push you from Clemensvale Conference on to Sussex Conference. And then you had a whole bunch of quick little gusts of wind. That would puff, puff you on to, to the Cape Breton Conference, and then on to Lancelou, maybe, and, and uh, Parsons Pond, and St. John's, and on on through the year. It just seems sometimes that we're wind-powered. And we're just kind of coasting along. You know, in the New Testament, being wind-powered is not necessarily a good thing. Now, it's okay to be propelled in that sense, to depend on the external power that comes. Do you know what the difficulty with that, what's wrong with it? The apostle speaks about being blown about with every wind of doctrine. It's okay to be wind-powered to a degree. But we have to be careful about the external forces to see that it's the right wind. There is, you could learn, we could learn something from the journeys of Paul. And, you know, the wind, the wind can be good, but the wind can be bad. So we need to be careful about that. But these disciples likely started out under wind power. And they're being puffed along and they're coasting along and things were pretty good. And maybe we can look back and we can think, well, I remember when we were wind powered. And maybe even now we could be coasting along. But then came the time when the wind was contrary, as we've learned. So then they had to be manpowered. Well, manpowered is all right, too. And now there's four men that take the oars, and they're kind of pulling the thing along. And they're trying their level best. You know what John tells us? He tells us in chapter 6 and uh, 19, he says that for all their rowing, they made it just about 25 to 30 furlongs. It seems that that likely is, they might have made five to six kilometers. For all they're worth, they're pulling and they're rowing. It's a difficult day, isn't it, when we're manpowered? When we think we have to do it on our own, you know, we do have to do, uh, we do, God does expect us to, to a certain degree to pull up our socks and grab the oars and dig in, dip the oars in and let her pull. Don't let the wind blow us just every which way. Just make sure the rudder is digging deep. Make sure it's pointed in the right direction. And the wind, when the wind is not going right, let's dip the oars and go against the wind. That's what they were trying to do. Now that's all right. That's all right. If the right men are pulling at the oars, that's wonderful. But we can't always be wind-powered, propelled by conferences and the message of others, external sources. And we can't always be man-powered. The energy of the flesh can kind of keep things and maybe take us through a low time. It's not a spiritual thing. What we need is good spiritual energy. We need the internal help and strength from God. That that's what we need. We need the transformation of the Spirit of God. We need the guidance, the external power of, of the Scripture. That's the power that we need. And here they are. They've been wind-powered, and now they're man-powered, and they're getting nowhere. Well, very little progress, and they've just kind of come to the conclusion we're not going to make it. You know, I've always pondered, and that's why maybe I'm thinking about the third system of propulsion. The third one is this. They're solar-powered but not the S-U-N, the S-O-N. They were solar powered. John says, I don't know what you make of it. I've always, I've always pondered this for years. What he says in verse 21 of his account, chapter six of John, and he says immediately they were at the land. I, I, I wonder about that. What, they toiled, the wind had taken them. They had, they had depended on good men. And they're rotating around. Everyone's taking a turn at the other. You know, it is a wonderful thing when we can work together in fellowship, when we're rowing together. Imagine if they were dipping their oars and going all different ways and the ship's going in circle. You know, there's one thing, just, just to let me pause for a minute and think about this. There's one thing the ship did. It may not have seemed like a very good place that night. They, they must have wished, I wish I'm back on the, I wish I was back on that little oasis there where we had the Lord. He was feeding us. 
And they look forlornly at those 12 baskets of food and maybe they're waterlogged and, and soggy. Now, I'm not sure, maybe not, but the Lord knew they needed that bread. They needed to sustain their energy. They needed the food from Christ. That helped them. That sustained them. That gave them, that gave them help for the rowing. That gave them the strength to do what Christ intended them to do. He knew they needed that. And he sent along those fragments that remained, 12 baskets, so to help them at the rowing. You know, I would be, it would be a wonderful thing tonight if, if my message, if, if just from Christ, it could be just a little something to remind us of the need for spiritual food, food from Christ to help us with our rowing. But we need to remember, we need to rely on Christ. And they, they needed to be S-O-N powered. The wind power is good. When it's the wind of doctrine that's good, when it's the external power of scripture that's really internal because we put it there, wonderful when we can do the man-powered part of it, our responsibility to bear our own burdens and to bear the burdens of others and to, to work together in fellowship, wonderful when we can do that, sustained by the basket that Christ has given us, one for each of them. I like that. One for each disciple as they rotated on the oars. I imagine Peter and John and James, they were likely the best rowers. I don't know what it was like when, when poor old Thomas, he gets in there and he's doubting. Uh, he likely had to be coached a little like, like I have to be. And there's Matthew. What did he know about the oars? He's telling the story here. Uh, and he's a tax collector. He's the office worker. And his hands aren't calloused by the oar, but he does his bit. Powered by Christ. You know, it isn't a marvelous thing what this little ship did. Might not have seemed like a great place to be. And what the ship did do? It kept them together. It kept them together. You know, the assembly may not seem like much. When we have to sit apart, when we have to mask, when we got to drink from our silly little cups and all the rest of it, and we, gotta, we can't shake hands and give a hug like we would like to be and all the silly, we can't meet the way we want to be. The assembly may not seem like much, but you know what it does? He's in our midst and he's keeping us together. The ship keeps us together, keeps us moving in fellowship. Let us not drop the oars, brethren and sisters. They kept at it. The wind was contrary. Yet maybe it's more of an amazing thing that against the wind, they propelled that little ship five to six kilometers. I, I think that was quite a feat. I think Christ would have been somewhat pleased with them for that amount at least. And so that was the propulsion that they relied on. But then I want to think of the imagination that plagued them. That's the fourth. one. The imagination that plagued them. Because here they are, and it comes to the climax of the story. It comes to the best part of the story. We know it because, I mean, we're so used to reading it. We, we love the part when Christ comes. But you picture what it was like for them being in the storm and they're rowing and they're switching places and the boat's rocking. I mean, that's not a big boat. And all of a sudden, at the very worst of it, in verse 26, all of a sudden they see something. Imagination gets the better and they say, oh, this is going from bad to worse. It is a spirit. It's an apparition. And they're afraid. Oh, no, it wasn't going from bad to worse. It was only getting good. This is the best part of the story. Well, maybe we can say, are we, maybe we're afraid just to allow our, our faith to kick in and think it must be almost over. This long haul, this stormy night. Well, whatever the case, our imagination can kick in. Their imagination plagued them. They said, it was a spirit. You don't want to think of the contrast. That was verse 26. Look at verse 27 says, they said, it is a spirit. What does Christ say? It is I. The, what, what is your imagination saying? Oh, it's a spirit. It's bad now. And Christ calmly says, no, no, it is I. Oh, may we hear his voice tonight. May we hear his voice. And let us, let us be looking for it, not for looking bad to worse and allowing our imaginations. That's what the apostle says. Be anxious for nothing. The disciple scolds, or rather, the, the Lord just scolds the disciples a little bit here because, because he said, where's your faith? They were going by imagination rather than faith. He had told them to go to the other side. Could they really go to the bottom when he said they were going to the other side? Well, I'll let, I'll let you answer that. 
but their imagination, they said, it is a spirit. And Christ said, it is I. What else did their imagination do? It brought them to a place of little faith and caused them to doubt. That's what he says in verse 31. Little faith. Wherefore did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt my word? Why did you doubt my, my power? Well, we may ask why, but with every finger that points at them, just remember we've got fingers pointing back at ourselves, don't we? Because we're like that. Imagination carries us away. And they're come to a place where their faith is just ebbing and it's so small, so small. It's, it, it's shrinking down and, and doubts are creeping in and crowding out. And so imagination caused them to say it's a spirit. He says it is I. Imagination brought them to a place of little faith and doubt. But it also brought them to a place of fear. He says, why were you afraid? Well, what if Christ came tonight? And he says to us, why were you afraid? Well, you say, well, I've got good reason. Well, I know we do when we look around. But that's the thing. They were, that's what Peter did. He looked at the wind. He saw the waves. Christ was bigger than the wind and the waves. And as he approached to them, and he says, it is I. And so that was the imagination that plagued them. And we've got it too. But to hurry on to the last one is this. The solution that they found in Christ. Now, that's really where it comes to. It was two parts, wasn't it? The first one had to do with his presence, his person. Where do we find Christ in this story? Because that will help us where we find him now. You know the first place we find Christ? He's on the mountain and he's praying. Doesn't that remind you of John 17, where the high priest is praying for his own? Doesn't that remind us of, of Hebrews with the high priest and what he has experienced? Because he is on the mountain and he's praying. Where's Christ tonight? He's exalted at the right hand of God. But he's our great high priest. He's interceding for us. He's there to see that we get through this. He is there to see that we get there. And here he is praying for them. He's on the mountain and he's praying. That's, that's the first thing we learn about his presence. That would help us greatly if we could get a hold of this, that while we're here, he is there. Where's the second place we find his person, his presence? Right there in the storm with them. You know why he could save Peter? Because he was right there in the storm with them. He understood what the waves were like. Hebrews tells us that. That we have a high priest, and he's experienced the waves. He's experienced the trials and tribulations of this world. He's experienced the wind and every force that was against him. He's come head to head with Satan. He's experienced the battlefield. He knows what it is on the, on the right hand of, uh, of the highest. He understands the heavenlies, but he also understands the storm. Could that encourage us this evening? To understand the first part of this solution came and is linked with the, the person of Christ, his presence, both on the mountain, pray, in heaven, the great high priest, but here in the storm with us. He's with us. I will never leave you or forsake you, Hebrews 13 tells us. And so that's the first part of the solution. The second part of the solution comes in his word, what he said. Think of what he said to them. I am. I am. What a word. What a word. Sometimes it would be wonderful if we could just get, just, just become more intimately acquainted with this person and look at the I am statements of John, for example, and the effect of those statements and how it meets the need in every case. In every case, there is a need, and the I am meets the need. And so here in the storm, there was a tremendous need. And the word that he gives them first is, it is I. I am. He gives us the I am tonight. But then he says, be of good courage. Or be of good cheer, rather. In other words, he's saying, take courage. Take courage. He knew the storm. Would he say that to us tonight, take courage? It's only a little bit further. The rowing is almost done. The wind will soon be over. Think about the one who is above the waves and the wind. 
Think about the one that everything is, is, is under his power and he can, he can bring us through. He might not always calm the storm when we think he should, but he can take us through the storm and the waves will be calm. And so he says, take courage. But what did he say to Peter? I like this one. I was enjoying this today. I must tell you, this was thrilling me. Never thought about it like this before. I always thought it was Peter. What a foolish man to get into the boat. No, no. What did the Lord say to him? He was only obeying the Lord. What did the Lord say? Come. Peter, come. Well, what would he say to us tonight if we're, if we're alarmed by the storm? You know what he would say? Come. You just come to me. I will give you rest. You just keep rowing. But you come to me. In the trial, in the good time, wherever it is, you come. Come to Christ. That's what Peter did. And he didn't do so well with that because he got, he got distracted again. But when he failed, the Lord was right there to pick him up. And then he says, what about your faith? Where was your faith? Why is your faith so small? You know what he's telling us? I, it was a little scolding. But you know what he's telling us through this little lesson that they learned? What's the lesson that we can learn? I think it's this. I, I was thinking about this today, and this is how it appealed to me. He would, he, he seems to be telling us and them, the secret to peace is faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. But it is only in faith. It is only in believing that we have peace that inner peace that passes understanding, that transcends circumstances. That's why the Lord put his finger on their faith. That's why he would do it tonight. He would put his finger on our faith, small though it may be. And he, he's telling them, just get our eye on the I am. Take courage. Be of good cheer. Come to me and put your faith, not in yourselves, not in the wind, not in the oars, all those things are great. Let's keep rowing. Let's keep working. And, and, and let's keep fellowship with one another. Let's, let's keep the maintenance of the ship. Let's keep working along in fellowship in the assembly. But let us not lose our, our focus on the Savior himself and our faith in him. Because it's because of him and through him that we can have peace in the storm. And it's through him we'll reach the other side. And that's what happened. And so we have have the action that precedes. We have the situation that developed, the propulsion that they relied on, the action that plagued them, and the solution uh, they found in Christ. I, I know these are simple things, but may we learn just a little lesson from them or two, and that we might have peace in the midst of the storm. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank thee for thy son. We appreciate the word of God. These are simple stories, and we understand that, that we could look into these things dispensationally, and we see the sea and the ship and all these things. There are things to be learned, and we recognize all of that. There are things that we could learn from the characters. We could look into Peter and learn wonderful things from him and some of the other disciples, and so many areas our focus could go, but we just pray that tonight we might learn a few of the practical lessons that are right here on the surface of the passage so that tonight we might all be encouraged and our faith might be increased as we just rely on the person and the power and the presence of Christ. Thank thee that while we are here, he is not only here with us. We, we've, uh, we, we know his presence by times and yet we so are quick, we're so quick to lose that and our faith shrinks and we're so small and, and we, we begin to sink. And we begin to worry, but we thank thee for the presence at the right hand. We thank thee for our position in him and for our great high priest above, the one who is.